So my brother and I, we grew up with Pokemon. Around here a lot of kids did. It worked perfectly for us too. Every time a new gen came out, one of us would get one version, and the other one would get the other. Since our mom liked to spoil us, we both got the third one. This is going to sound at first like a bittersweet story about two siblings who grow up with a couple of games that eventually take them down two different roads. Well, it's a little more than that. The years rolled away, we kept collecting. Game Boys got old, we replaced them, cartridges finally gave out, we picked up new copies. But we started down two completely different roads, before Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald came out. See, around then my brother got a Game Shark. We had heard all the hacks and cheats you could do with them, even if we were kinda late to the party. And they sounded awfully cool. Our first guinea pig cartridge was my brother's old blue version. We dicked around a little bit. Nothing major, but whatever we did, we fucked the cartridge up. After just a couple code entries, it glitched and completely became unplayable. Naturally, we were upset at first. My brother mourned the loss of his hours of work, and I was sympathetic. I told him it was okay, we can replace it. But here, our paths finally differed. After seeing the mess it had turned blue version into, I had become opposed to the idea of hacking or cheating in any of my games. What can I say? But my brother had taken his game destruction as a personal challenge or something. I don't think he ever played a game after that which wasn't hacked somehow. Yeah, he played a shit ton of Pokemon, but for us that really was the only thing to do. We live way out in the country, without many other kids, and the farmers didn't want us on their property, so we played Pokemon out in the lawn, just about every day. It was pretty awesome us at least. We lost the game shark when our rooms got moved around. A new addition was built into our house, and it disappeared in the mess of shit and just got stuffed in a new closet. Ruby, Emerald, Sapphire arrived. After playing through them once, we both had an agreement that it's definitely lacking in comparison to last gen. We both tried an honest playthrough, and we managed to finish. It left us both yearning for some good old fashioned nostalgia, so we got our gold, silver, and crystal cartridges. It took us probably a month or so to dig through the boxes we'd been lazy to open up before, and we finally found a full shitload of our old electronics. My old purple Game Boy Color still worked. His red one would no longer hold batteries in place. Both of our GBAs were fine though, along with our snake lights and link cables. We both grabbed up everything we could. It was so nice to have yellow, which had been my first and most cherished game of the series, and red and gold back. We went through the motions of checking our old files, taking the old memories, and eventually we figured Gen 1 stuff was just too nostalgic to get rid of. I restarted gold, he restarted silver. Immediately, he snatched the Game Shark out of the box and slipped it into the back of his GBA. I just shook my head at him. I remember what I said to him. That thing will kill your game, you know. At least I think that's what I said. He had liked me preaching to him about abusing pixels. I shut my mouth after that but I had put him off playing the game with me. I guess it was just one too many times or something. It was a couple days later that it happened. I was out at the porch, Game Boy in hand, just about to go into the Leap 4 when I realized I needed a little help. My team was ill-balanced thanks to playing through with for leisure. And at the time, I was no great trainer that could pull off gimmick runs. I knew my brother had just been two badges ahead of me when we last checked with one another, so I was hoping maybe he'd let me borrow a Pokemon. Now the thing is, I'd spent the last 24 hours at a friend's place. I'd literally come home, dumped my bag in my room, and crept out into the sun for with my GBA to play. I had no idea what he'd been up to. For all I know, 
he could have finished it and started a new one. Which I figured was all the better for me since I wouldn't need those Pokemon, I'd stand a better chance of nicking a few. So I got up and went into his house. And when I was crossing to the living room, I noticed all of the Pokemon games lying on the floor. Some of the cartridges had been mangled, like they'd been hacked with something sharp. Even his old blue version, long ago dead and too sentimental to throw away, was lying with the plastic cut and ragged. I split almost halfway up one side, completely unusable. Even if it would have worked, I was a little scared. This had to have happened this morning, otherwise our mom wouldn't have just let it be lying on the carpet. Tucking my GPA into my pocket, I crept over to his room to find the door unlocked. Somehow, that was even more concerning. I walked in and found my brother sitting on the edge of his bed. His GBA was in place on the floor at his feet, smashed into bits. Next to him on the bed was a hammer and our mother's gardening scissors. His face was paler than I'd ever seen it. His face was paler than I'd ever seen it. Even whiter than the time we'd gone corning and the old guy up the street, legally blind and raving nutcase, had come and chased us through the trees with a shotgun. It was now I also noticed the game shark was on the ground, the silver cartridge in the corner poking from under his bed. Somehow, they had been spared the wrath of the hammer. Hey, uh, are you okay? I asked. I remember the chills that ran through me. He was my little brother. Seeing him like this was horrifying. It was awful. I hear him rasping, and the way his voice rattled made my knees weak. Oh God, white everywhere, and then black. I remember running over to him and hugging him, and I remember his limp arm fell brushed to the Game Boy in my pocket, and his sudden scream right in my ear, making me jump and bite my tongue. He ripped the handheld from my pocket and hurled it as far as he could against the wall. I cried out at the dent plastic system made there. Running over to collect it, the screen had gone dark. Even though I feared the worst, when I switched it on, it turned on normally. I waited there in the corner, trying to pretend the GBA mattered enough not to go to run for our mom. The theme started up, and he screamed again, picking up the hammer. This time I screamed too, and ran from my room with my GBA clutched to my chest like a shield. He ended up in the psych ward for the hospital for a couple days. When I went to visit him, I left my GBA at home. No one could figure out what had set off that strange, manic behavior. There was some talk that I didn't understand, but even though Mom and I had collected and brought enough and all these cut-up cartridges to be looked at, no one had even thought it would tie back to the game. Maybe that was my fault. I haven't said a word about what happened when he had accidentally touched my Game Boy, or the blind white terror he had been thrown into when the music started. On the last visit to the hospital before school on the second day, I was left alone in the room with him while well, my mom had some private talk with the doctor about precautions and to make sure this wouldn't happen again. I sat in a chair next to the bed, where he was staring at the ceiling. But he suddenly sat up, making me flinch. Hey, he told me, go into my room when you get home. I didn't understand what he meant, and then I remembered the things that he hadn't packed when he brought in. The game and the hacking tool under his bed. Get rid of them. I don't ever want to play them again. His voice was weary and desperate. He sounded like an old man on his deathbed. My poor damaged brother. How could I refuse? I promise you'll get rid of them. Okay, alright, I promise. I was carted off to school late. And though the whole day I only had my promise to him in my head, I didn't know it at the time. But this would be the last time that I could ever play the big brother role and help him out. I just had to get him home and get rid of that game. But as the day went on, a sick curiosity started to go through my own head. What could possibly have happened that scared him so badly? I was scared myself, but I just had to know. I had to know. I got home and went right to his room, bent on uncovering whatever horror was waiting me. Mom had since vacuumed the room. The cartridge and the game shark were no longer visible. I got down and crawled half under the bed, feeling timid but holding on to promise. Under the bed was enough dust to make me cough, enough Legos and various other toys that I couldn't set my elbow down without landing on something. 
but I finally saw both objects. They'd been covered in the corner, on top of a notebook, and that looked too new to have been there for long. Unthinking, I grabbed the corner of the paper and dragged everything out with me, still wheezing, you know, with allergies and all. They look so innocent. Simple toys, and a simple spiral bound with a bunch of papers. When I set Silver Version and Game Shark on the floor, I took a closer look at the notebook. On it were scrawled in at least 20 different sheet codes, but one had been scratched out with Sharpie over where it had initially been drawn in pen. This was really confusing. He had really tried to erase it out. The marker had been pressed to the paper so hard that I think it soaked through most of the pages behind it. Almost two-thirds of the way through was black. But pen has a way of sticking around. I picked up the notebook and tilted it backwards towards the light, and the reflective surface of the sharpie revealed the indents of what were left and where it had written. The code was an unintelligible mess of letters and numbers, but the words next to it confused me. Easter egg. Snow on Mount Silver. I remember what he said when I found him. He had been raving about white, white and then black. Could he mean snow? Even though it was only August and the temperature was still climbing 90 degrees every day, a chill ran down my spine. I picked up everything and brought it to my room. I laid it out on the carpet in front of me with my own GBA next to it. For a long time, I just stared down at it. And the longer I looked, the more maniacal Lugia's face became on the sticker like some kind of twisted grin, like it was daring me to find out what happened to my brother. I was a 14-year-old kid. Did I really want to tempt fate and risk ending up like him? I glared down to see Lugia for a while longer. I had to see. I slid gold out of my GBA and stuck silver in its place. It took me almost 15 minutes to compose myself and turn it on. I started it up normally. I left the sound on low, too afraid of what I might hear. The title screen was normal, you know, Lugia again, but somehow menacing. Despite my common sense telling me it was exactly the same picture as every other time I started up the game. How bad could this be? I asked myself. His notes said Easter egg. Didn't that mean that the coding was already in the game? The menu came up, still absolutely normal. His character was Blake, with a mostly filled Pokedex. But the time was odd. 999 999 I knew he couldn't have played for that long. I had barely logged 50 hours in my same game. That was playing slowly, probably the result of his hacking. Well, whatever then. The game started up. The first thing I noticed was a prolonged black screen. It took almost a minute for everything to change, and there was no sound at all. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing up, but it was too late to turn back. Finally, a very dim sort of map came to the screen, but it looked like static. What's going on? I squinted down as I realized with a fearsome pang that this was actually the Mount Silver map. But what I thought was static was a heavy falling snow, so this was where he had last saved the game. I checked the party, a very normal team, with someone who's been using a Game Shark, Typhlosion, Fraligator, Magnium, Pidgeot, Tyranitar, Lugia, all level 100 with modded moves. <laughs> Typical form. Something about the sprites was strange though. They seemed sullen in a way. Their colors seemed washed out. Their expressions lacked any usual vigor that they normally had. I chalked this up to missing pixels or something and also due to the hacking I guess, I don't know. The map had brightened up, just a smidgen when I closed out the start menu. Indeed, the snow was falling, falling very heavily. The pixels danced across the screen so fast that I couldn't see the main sprite. Something was off about him, too. When I checked his information, it was the same as the Pokemon sprites. The colors were dull. In fact, now that I thought about it, he almost looked frostbitten. My stomach frightened and I tried to move back down the mountain. As I hit the bottom of the screen, words popped up. And there was finally a sound, my sprite hitting an invisible wall. You can't turn back now. This was... unsettling. 
I went into my Pokemon and tried to see if I could use Pidgeot's fly ability. You can't fly in this. Obviously referring to the snow. <sighs> Whatever. I thought, going into his bag, there was an escape rope. I tried using it. I can't go back anymore. What's going on? Once again, I tried to walk down the mountain. And to my horror, the words changed with every attempt. I can't run away. I can't go back down. I can never go back. This last one sent a rigid feeling through my heart. There was no way down the mountain. I had to climb. Turning the sprite around, I moved him forward. No resistance at all, though my walking speed was oddly slow. What was truly weird was the lack of grass, or trainers, or anything but white snow really, which still blew across the screen and made it almost impossible to see. As I moved further up the mountain, his walking became slower, and slower, and slower. The static curtain of pixels grew thicker, so that I could barely make out the features of the map. But it seemed like the only way to move. I reached what looked like a set of stairs at the very top edge of the screen. I didn't remember seeing this before. As I tried to move up, the little sprite paused. I'm cold. By now, I was even getting goosebumps. His walking speed became painfully slow. As if someone was being impeded, more text came on the screen. Magnium has died. Meganium has died. What the fuck? I thought... Pokemon don't die in these games. I checked my party, and was frightened and confused by what I saw. Meganium's sprite had been replaced by a red X. All my other Pokemon sported a varying degree of damage. Though I hadn't battled once, I went to my bag and found a single revive and I tried to use it. It's too late, it said. What kind of easter egg was this? There wasn't much else I could do. Trying to turn around yielded the same messages as before, so I kept moving. Pidget has died. I checked again. Sure enough, there was a little red X. This time I selected and looked at the Pokemon itself, trying to figure out what was wrong. I wish I had it. The sprite was mangled. Pieces of it were missing. What was left was splotched with a sickish blue-gray color. Its eye was solid black. Solid black pit. I flipped down to Meganium. Same deal. Missing leg. Chunk of its neck. Most of its head. Morbid curiosity urged me onward, and the path never devastated from the straight upward road I'd traveled the entire time. Along the way, every now and then, another party of Pokemon would die. An examination of its sprite would show it was in the same condition as the others, until all that was left was Typhlosion. One more staircase was up ahead. I climbed it, braced for whatever awaited me. I hit the summit. It was deserted. Red was nowhere to be found, and the snow had stopped falling. In the very center of the map was something sticking out of the snow. It looked like a Pokeball. Okay, maybe all this stuff led up to some climatic final battle, using whatever was in there if I picked it up. Maybe Red would come out of hiding. I walked over and examined it. There was a burst of static noise from my game that made me jump. What appeared on the screen was a battle animation, my trainer sprite appearing. The skin tinged blue, against another mangled Pokemon sprite. It was Celebi. In the center of that black hole was an eye. A single red dot burned like an ember. But the thing looked rotted. It didn't even throw out my mostly dead Typhlosion before it had moved. Celebi used Parish Song. A screech came out of my GBA, and I'd almost dropped it, and the screen went white. Part of me was relieved thinking my final Pokemon had been KO'd and I'd been transported to a Pokemon Center. But I was wrong. My sprite reappeared in what looked like a cave. Was I now inside the mountain? I checked my trainer card and felt sick. The sprite was just as mauled as the Pokemon had been, a leg gone, a single eye remaining. Pitch black. And so, so filled with despair. Tears welled up at the corner and every other color on him was replaced by those six shades of frosty blue and gray. Every stat on the card was reduced to zero, except the time, 
which was still maxed out. I quickly moved back to the map. His sprite there mimicked the horror it had become on the trainer card. Pieces were missing, and everything was discolored. I started trying to walk, and I received a message. It's so cold. There was only one direction to go. Upward. I moved on, and every now and then I would be stopped by a message that made my heart sink. Mother? It feels so cold. I can't go on. The walls, as I walked, became darker and darker until they were pitch black at the end. There was an exit there, marked only by a white outline. I had no other choice but to go through it. I had opened the chamber that was also solid white. The only way to distinguish the walls from the thin gray line that marked them as a separate from the floor. Against the far wall was another sprite. Red sprite. Intact. I'd come this far. I had to finish this. I walked right up to him and hit A. Dot dot dot. And a battle started. Red Sprite had none of the deformities that mirrored my own. The colors were the same, just blues and grays. But he was intact. He just looked... extremely sad. His first Pokemon came out, Venusaur. It was just like my own had been, but level zero. With a speck of health, I sent out Typhlosion, who just had six HP left. No Pokemon made a sound, and they were brought into battle. Venusaur, you struggle. There was no animation. It was just a single point of damage done to Typhlosion. Then the opposing spite dropped off the screen. Venusaur had died. There was no text asking me to switch out. Instead, there was just dialogue from Red. Dot dot dot. His next Pokemon was Blastoise, even more mangled than Venusaur had been. It too struggled and died. After each round, there was that ominous dot 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 from the trainer. <laughs> Every sprite was more damaged than the last. His Espeon was barely distinguishable as a Pokemon. I realized somewhere he was sending them out of order, which saved one Pokemon for last. Pikachu came out, and it was grotesque. It too was discolored like it was frostbitten. It was missing an ear, half its body and tail. Its head was mostly intact, but his eyes were much larger than they should have been, and it glared out at me like pitch black windows into hell. But the thing that got to me the most was the giant smile that had extended almost all the way to the edges of his head. Its health somehow was at zero, or at least looked that way. My hands were shaking. I didn't get a chance to attack. Pikachu used pain split. Pikachu has died. Typhlosion has died. It cut back to an image of Red Sprite, and now it looked like mine. With his body so butchered it looked like a carcass stripped off most of its meat. Except, it has those same soulless deranged eyes as Pikachu. I finally understood what happened. They were dead. They were all dead. And this sub-level of the mountain was the hell they now existed in. Red finally spoke. It's over. The screen flashed back in white for a moment. Used Destiny Pond. A horrible, hideous screeching started to issue from my GBA. The screen went white and it shrieked at me, and I threw it on the floor and pressed my back against the bed. The horrible noise continued for several long moments, while the screen stayed white. Then it went black. Then there was silence. It took me a long few moments, but I eventually stood up. I took the Game Shark and took out the notebook. I took the fucking possessed game. I picked them up and carried them to the garbage. When I got back to the house, I don't know what made me do it, but I picked up the yellow version and inserted it into my Game Boy. I think it was part of me determined to make sure I hadn't somehow been tainted as well. The music started up, the game played, I turned to my Pikachu and hit A. Its smiling face greeted me with an ear twitch and a pixelated smile. A pleasant, normal smile. I turned my game off and spent the next hour crying on the floor. My brother and I did never play Pokemon together again. He gave it up for good. 
I stuck to replaying my comforting, unhacked games. That winter, the snow did fall thick. Thank you. 